I have an awesome treat for us today. On this episode, I am going to be interviewing my husband, my best friend, Jay Skeeters. I'm Rose Skeeters, host of From Borderline to Beautiful, a show about hope and recovery for BPD. All right, let's just jump right in. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to be asking Jay and he'll answer. And if you guys have any questions outside of what we're talking about today, send us a message. We'll show you how at the end of the podcast. All right, question number one. What is it like being with someone with BPD? Uh, well, just like any other relationship, uh, there's going to be ups and downs. Um, if you are in a relationship with someone with BPD, there are a few things that stand out. Um, you know, f- to me, the first thing with, uh, you know, when I was dating Rose is she's a lot of fun. Um, people with BPD, uh, they tend to go with the flow, doing different activities, going on adventures, trying out new foods, uh, in general, just easy to be around. Uh, Rose and I, we have a great time when we travel, we go out on dates, we hike, we camp, uh, just whatever. We just really enjoy being around each other and, and having a lot of fun. Um, then, you know, there's the flip side. It can sometimes seem as if the relationship's one-sided. Um, for example, temperament, um, those with BPD can be pretty intense at times. Um, they can have an entire dialogue scenario and outcome all played out in their mind before they even let you know when something's actually bothering them. Uh, this used to make me feel like I had done something wrong, even when whatever was bothering, uh, Rose really had nothing to do with me. Um, so sometimes it could be a little confusing, uh, people with, uh, BPD tend to be coming out of bad relationships in their past, uh, because of dealing with partners who didn't know how to deal with their temperaments. Um, so when they find somebody who's willing to deal with the temperament, they latch on. So it's up to me, uh, to know how to handle that. And it's up to, to me, it's up to the partners to know how to handle, uh, the temperament. Um, you know, I'm a very loyal guy and I know Rose is loyal too. So, you know, once I created the formulas on how to deal with her mood swings, there really was no true problems that would force our relationship to end. Um, we've been together for seven years now and created a great partnership in which both of us feel as if we're cared for. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Question two is about hyperbolic temperament. So I've talked about this before that people with BPD have... Um, basically they live in a big hyperbole. Everything is over the top, intense, and embellished. So I am wondering, what does hyperbolic temperament mean to you? Well, to me, hyperbolic temperament uh, means that you've already created a perception about a certain subject or a thing, whether making it really, really big or minimizing it. Um, to try to make uh, reality fit in your perception, which of course is impossible. Uh, reality will always be reality and your perception will always, you know, if you have a hyperbolic temperament, you will most likely embellish whatever your reality is. Um, in a relationship, uh, the problem with hyperbolic temperament is that we just can't trust that everything that you know, somebody with hype, uh, with BPD is saying is actually true or at least accurate. Um, so how I combat that is whenever there's something that I'm getting the vibe that there's a hyperbole being made, um, you know, and you and I have come up, come to a point in which we just kind of laugh about this. Um, I will walk you through your statement and ask you if it's really what you meant to say, you know, for example, there've been times in which, you know, you've, yelled out, you know, it's 20 freaking degrees in here and you won't let me turn the uh, thermostat up. And, you know, to me, I'm like, okay, really? Is it really 20 degrees in here? You know, let's go take a look. You know, of course it's hyperbole, but um, somebody with BPD or just a hyperbolic temperament in general, um, they need to learn how to tell the truth. You know, they need to be accountable for the things that they actually say. Um, it can be kind of annoying, but when you've developed a relationship over the course of years or just develop that trust, um, 
it doesn't necessarily have to be so intense. Um, you know, so in that example, she was cold. Um, but, you know, she also would tend to sit around in a t-shirt and shorts. Um, so, you know, as the, on the partner side, hyperbolic temperament, it just needs patience and redirection. Um, when you can make your partner understand that they're speaking hyperboles in a very obvious and blatant way, they'll begin to catch themselves. So now, you know, she, whenever she knows that she's kind of embellishing a story or minimizing a story, um, she actually stops herself and is like, oh, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm adding a little bit too much to it. Um, because then it allows me to track what she's saying accurately and I can actually help her or, you know, just listen to her vent in a way that she's, you know, telling the truth as it really is. Are you tired of feeling frustrated, resentful, or disconnected from your family, friends, and partner? Thrive Mind Body LLC Mindset Coaching and Counseling can help you. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. Again, that's thriveonlinecounseling.com. And receive 10% off your first session pack with coupon code THRIVE10. See you then. All right. Question number three. How did you deal with the loneliness that comes with having a selfish partner? Uh, I had to point it out to you. Um, I had to make you aware that I didn't have any emotional space in the relationship. Um, there would be times in which, again, um, I'd have to walk you through whatever scenario that had me feeling lonely like that so that I could make you see my point of view. Uh, so whatever the scenario was, I would have to explain the scenario by letting you know that I understand exactly how you are feeling, but then start all the way back at the beginning of the scenario all over again and show you my side of it uh, so that you could get a grasp on my point of view of of the subject. Um, it's tr It's difficult at times um, because you want to get angry and you want to you know just let them have it but it's not productive and it doesn't allow your partner to have an understanding of your perspective and your side of of that feeling of loneliness um, because if they didn't know at the beginning, they certainly aren't going to know if you're just um, combating them with anger or frustration. Um, so again, it's grabbing their hand and walking them through step by step through the scenario. So that way, everybody can see just how blatantly obvious that, you know, both sides of the scenario contributed and both sides of the scenario have, you know, space for emotion and, and feelings. Awesome. So it's like you walked me through the process of developing empathy, of figuring out what your point of view was, right? Exactly. All right. So let's jump to the last question of today's episode. What advice can you give to partners, family, and friends of people with BPD when they experience effective lability? So that's when our emotions become intense and unstable. Should those people that love us avoid quote unquote triggers? Well, to answer the first question, uh, what advice can you give to partners, families, and friends of people with BPD um, is always tell the truth. Uh, you cannot allow someone you care about to live incongruent to the life that they want. Um, People with BPD want things too. You know, they want a certain lifestyle just like anybody else. Um, but their behaviors and actions may be incongruent and they just need to be pointed out. Um, and just like I used to tell you, uh, you know, you can be mad at me all you want, um, but I just need you to hear the truth once. Yeah. Whatever you want to do with that information, that's on you. But if you're going to, 
be dealing with me, you know, it's my responsibility to, to make sure that you understand the truth, or at least you have the truth, whether you want to understand it or not. Um, the second part of that question, avoiding triggers, no way. Um, the more triggers you avoid, the more ammo people, ammo people with BPD have. Um, triggers, they have to be met, met head on. Uh, there will be conflict at first, um, but if you want the relationship to survive, uh, you have to stand up for yourself. Uh, communicate with them that there is a different way to look at whatever it is that's triggering them. Uh, they just don't see it. Uh, so as being a good partner or friend or family member to someone, anyone really that, that I care about, uh, you know, you want to tell them the truth and you want to point out things that they could possibly do better um, and show them how to do it better. Uh, you know, coach them um, because like I said, if you want the relationship to survive, you have to do these things or you're just going to run out of energy. You're going to run out of tolerance. Um, and that's when the relationship is in real jeopardy. Uh, but until you can start meeting those triggers head on and walking them through them, you know, as a loving partner, um, it's... You know, it's going to be challenging uh, until you can get to that point in the relationship where you can communicate like that with one another. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's our Boston Terrier boomer in the background, if you can hear that. So thank you. I love that. Uh, basically, you're saying you said that avoiding the triggers give us more ammo. Yeah. So the more triggers you avoid, the more ammo people with BPD have. That is so awesome that you say that because usually like the emotional intensity that we experience have people that love us walking on eggshells around us. And the more we get people to walk on eggshells, the less likely it is that we'll ever be able to hear the truth. So if you're out there and you love someone with BPD, tell them the truth. If you allow them to set up this world where you can't say anything because it'll quote unquote trigger them, that will make them stay stuck in the state that they're in. And for everyone that has BPD, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Stop making the people that love you walk on eggshells because it just makes you live in this identity of an, a person with BPD forever. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so if you're out there and you have BPD and you have a question for me, or if you're a partner or a loved one and you have a question for Jay, wait till the end of this episode and you'll see how to send us a message through Anchor, or you can send me an email at rose at thriveonlinecounseling.com or jay at thriveonlinecounseling.com. We would love to answer any questions that you may have and even have Jay back on a future episode. All right, thanks so much. Until next week. Okay, thanks for listening. That was from Borderline and Beautiful, a production of Thrive Mind Body LLC, online coaching that helps frustrated individuals, resentful couples, and disconnected families navigate through tough times. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. If you like this show, remember, you can hear it on Anchor or Apple Podcasts, or Pocket Casts, or any app that you use to listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get a new episode every Monday. If you want to get in touch, you can leave me a voice message. Some of you had some comments and questions from the last episodes, and I'd love to hear whatever questions you have too. Just download the Anchor mobile app, search for From Borderline to Beautiful, and tap the message button to send me a voice message. We'll have all those links in the show description. Okay, we made it. Thanks again for listening. I'm Rose Skeeters, and I'll be back next week with another episode of From Borderline to Beautiful. Talk to you then.